thank you everyone for joining us. Um, it is important to mention that we are in a global pandemic and I appreciate the time that you are taking to be here with us. During this week, we should be at Amsterdam sharing and meeting each other, but it was not possible. And I think none of us would imagine that this would happen. We have a really difficult scenario in the energy industry. There is a lot of people losing their jobs and there is a lot of changes that with a high uncertainty. This week, we, uh, last week actually, we saw the report for Wood and Mackenzie talking about the different scenarios of how the energy scenario will transform depending on what is the path that we follow. Today, we are here talking about energy transition. And I think we are all aware that this is a critical, this is the critical decade to act. But why we talk about energy transition? First, because it's urgent. And second one, because it's logical. Urgent because we know we are improving the situation, the lifestyle that we have now if we act around mitigation. And at the same time, we are avoiding the worst effects of climate change. And logical because we know that the way that we are living and using our resources is going to take us anywhere. In this presentation, or normally in the industry, we talk a lot about technology, we talk about the finances, and we talk a lot sometimes about ecosystems. But we cannot forget that this is about people and it's millions of lives that we will be saving if we act on time for climate change. This session is focused on solutions and plans and lessons learned. And as Christiana Figueres, one of the architects of Paris Agreement say, we have almost all, we have all if we have, we have most, if not all, the technologies and the talent for the energy transition. And one of my favorite sentences for her book is that blame looks backwards, but responsibility looks forward. And that's what we should do, what we are doing in this session. We know that the challenge should be addressed collectively, and that's why we try to do in this section, this session. We gather people from leadership, from technology, and we all, and we also try to cover a broad spectrum of geographical. This is an opportunity for all of us to talk about solutions and plans. And that's why, that's why today I want to ask you two things. The first one is that with the people that is connect, if you know another initiative or solution that is mitigating climate change in the energy sector, please share it in the chat. And the second favor is that if you have questions, please write it on the chat or keep it to the end. What we will do during this presentation, okay, that, that's a reminder. I want you to share what initiative you know, and I also want to ask to write the questions on the chat. We will start the presentations. Each speaker will have 10 minutes, and then we are expecting to read your questions for 15 minutes. And after that, open the microphones for discussions. We are aiming to finish in one hour and a half. Uh, all the speakers will go together and then at the end we will have the discussion panel. No further, I want to start with Julian. Julian will tell us about the practical actions from the oil and gas industry to mitigate climate change. Welcome, Julian. Hello. <coughs> Hello, Ingrid. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm sorry, my connection is not extremely good and I've just been disconnected for the last two minutes. So I unfortunately missed your introduction, Ingrid. I apologize for that if I don't make any echo uh, to, to it. Uh, so thanks a lot for, for welcoming us. Um, we do introduce to the audience what OGCI is and what are the type of action that we're conducting. So I don't know, Benjamin or Ingrid, if uh, one of you is able to put the slides uh, on the screen. Julian, I'm also going to ask you to please um, remove the camera. Yes. Yeah. Trying to improve the connection because we cannot hear you properly. Okay, is it better like this? Yes. 
Okay, great. Uh, I'll, I'm going to try to speak slowly as well, just in case um, I'm, I'm cut during uh, during my speech. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry. Really, the connection is really poor on my side. I can't see if you're sharing the slides I've shared, but I imagine that this is the case. So let me start and uh, please stop me if it was not the case. Let me double check. Uh, we can't see yet. One minute, please. Okay, good. So wh while you're doing that, just maybe as a quick introduction for those of you who are not um, aware of uh, what OGCI is and, and what it's it's meant to be. So OGCI is uh, stands for First Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. It was launched uh, back in September 2014 at the Climate Week uh, by the CEO of uh, Saudi Aramco at that time, uh, Khaled al Faleh and was already gathering a group of, I think, five or six companies. And since then, we've been growing uh, to 12 companies uh, that are today member, active member of OGCI, uh, covering, and you have the logos here at the bottom of the slide, um, covering IOCs and NOCs, uh, and trying to identify areas where, as a group, we can be additional to accelerate uh, the low carbon transition for the oil and gas industry, but more importantly for the energy and the industry value chain, because we do think that um, the combination of the companies bring uh, a combination of skill sets and expertise that uh, could actually unlock a certain number of situations that does not necessarily uh, address uh, un uniquely the scope one and two or three of the oil and gas industry. So if you please move on to the next slide. Um, the, the OGCI, uh, as I mentioned, aims to be additional. Uh, it's also uh, one of the characteristics of this initiative is that it's a CEO-led initiative, i.e. the CEOs of each of the member companies are regularly connecting uh, to uh, take the decision of what OGCI do, should do or not do based on recommendations that are coming from uh, the team and the, and the work streams that are composed again by uh, the member companies. So it's really uh, an initiative that is driven by the member companies and is done for the member companies. I think it's quite important to, to have that in mind. So again, aiming to be additional, aiming to be ambitious. So we try to push always the agenda a little bit further down uh, and trying to uh, deliver some actions that would uh, result into greenhouse gas emission reduction. So by being additional, uh, and I think really it's, for me it's really potentially the, the key characteristic of OGCI is um, that we address the hard to scale up solution. Uh, we don't want to repeat what our member companies are already doing individually or what the market is already offering, but more to address uh, the solution for the transition that are difficult to be done. And so uh, being a group uh, enable um, to do things that each of the individual member could not afford to do it alone because too risky, because too early stage, or because needing expertise that are not always fitting 100% uh, in one of uh, one of the member companies, but the combination of the companies make the expertise available. So that's why you can see that in the focus area that we have uh, highlighted in this slide, um, there is not specifically an action on renewable energy or um, on electric vehicle. Doesn't mean that we don't think that those solutions will be part of uh, the transition. Of course, they will be. But we, don't, we, do, uh, we do not see any specific role for OGCI as a group to tackle uh, this challenge compared to what we could do on CCUS or on methane, which is another role of gas label here or on transport, specifically on heavy duty vehicle, for instance, or marine. Those three areas, I will expand a little bit what we do uh, if, uh, a little bit later in my presentation. And then we'll also look at other areas like natural climate solutions, energy efficiency, and um, low emission opportunities is more our internal think tank to, to draw uh, what could be the future of OGCI and assess, for instance, the climate model or uh, the various um, um, you know, uh, input we could receive from external stakeholder like IE, et cetera. And one of the action that OGCI, for instance, uh, and, and I will illustrate um, uh, across my presentation, various actions that we 
we did and so answer to the question of what are the practical action that we are taking but one of the practical action that was put in place in uh, june 2017 so two years ago uh, was the creation of ogci climate investment so ogci ci which is a 1 billion plus fund funded by uh, the member companies of ogci and that is taking equity into startups or projects that are directly in connection with the topics that I mentioned above, and specifically CCOS, methane, transport efficiency, and energy efficiency. Those four areas are part of the climate investment portfolio. So the, the way we see uh, the climate challenge uh, very quickly is that there is a number of challenges and opportunities for the oil and gas industry, and that there is a role to play for the oil and gas. So we are not only part of the problem, but we are definitely part of the solution. And there is a number of areas that we do see uh, the oil and gas industry or group of stakeholders gathering large uh, oil and gas players like us could bring um, some key skill sets that are required to accelerate the low carbon transition, like, for instance, having the long term vision or the capacity to invest uh, patient capital. So uh, making very long term investment bringing the technical expertise when you talk about carbon uh, CCOS, uh, there is a clear need for uh, subsurface expertise. And the oil and gas industry is probably one of the unique industry able to provide this kind of, of expertise to understand what are the reservoirs and how you can store the CO2 for a long period of time. Having the capacity also to run a very large project uh, involving international stakeholders from public and private domain with very complex project management uh, having the capacity also to co-invest or, or, or share the risk for co-investment. Uh, that's exactly the kind of skill set that, again, uh, the oil and gas industry is probably uniquely positioned to provide as a combination. And that actually meets the needs for the transition when you have to deal with how to abate sector or CCOS or building the trust with stakeholders when it comes to technical solution that needs uh, expertise uh, to be proven. So if you move on to the next slide, I will, I'm will. i going to illustrate that uh, with what we see as uh, the, 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 the transition toward the two degree scenario. So the graph on the right hand side should soon familiar to most of you, I guess. It's one of the representation that you can have of what are the greenhouse gas emission in a business as usual scenario toward the 1.5 or two degree scenario. And that's actually highlight the fact that uh, the transition is extremely um, hard to, to tackle because the reduction that is expected in the next 10 years, if we take 2030, it's only 10 years ahead, is to reduce by one quarter to one half uh, the greenhouse gas emission. <clears throat> Of course, this trend is extremely uh, hard to, to address, particularly when we think that if you make the parallel with the coronavirus crisis that we are all experiencing and the economic downturn that, that comes along with it, actually, it's uh, the greenhouse gas emission reduction that we are experiencing are more or less the one that we should follow to reach a 1.5 degree scenario. So you can, you can understand that um, all, of, all of the action will not go through only mitigation, but there will have to be solution to capture and store CO2 emission either by the technology or by natural climate solution, because mitigation cannot do all uh, in the very short time frame. will will probably expand its footprint as we progress, but at the beginning we'll definitely need to have solution that enable to capture and store uh, the CO2 emission. And that's particularly true even when you look at sector uh, sectoral decarbonization. So if you expand the right hand side graph for, uh, for instance, the automotive industry, that would mean that we would have to reduce the greenhouse gas emission for um, the automotive industry and the uh, scope three basically by 80%. Or for the electricity, it's almost reducing to zero uh, between now and 2050. So. The challenge ahead is extremely high, and that's why we think that there is a combination of solutions that has to be put in, on the table, combining mitigation and um, solution for removing uh, greenhouse gas emission from the emitter point or from the atmosphere. So if you move on to the next slide, <coughs> please. So the way we, we, we address that <coughs> is that we've... Um, oh, sorry, the previous one, please. Yeah, this one, thanks. So the way we, we address that is that we, we've built up uh, the strategy of OGCI around what we call the circular carbon concept. 
uh, and we try to address each of the each of those points um, very quickly. How it looks, how you can read it, is that we we start by um, reducing and identifying areas where how we can reduce and improve energy efficiency, i.e. What, what is uh, a way for us to reduce the quantity of energy needed for the same economic services. Then for the energy that has to be consumed, how we can reduce the footprint of the energy to the minimum. So involving again here, the renewable energy, but also lowering uh, the carbon footprint of ex existing energy sources, like the oil and gas, for instance, or the existing uh, power generation. And for the energy that has to be consumed and has to be carbon-based, then uh, try to capture and store the CO2 emission. And for the energy that has to be consumed is carbon-based and for which you can't uh, capture the CO2 emission, typically the mobile, mobile carbon sources like uh, automotive industry, then we try to expand solutions that remove the CO2 from the atmosphere. And that's uh, what, uh, what is written by balancing the remaining emission. Thanks uh, in particular for natural climate solution. So if you move on to the next slide, um, the, um, the, the key announcement that we made uh, on the past few years is, first of all, as I mentioned, the launch of the climate investment. Also, we've delivered the methane intensity target, and I will explain that a little bit more, but we've aligned, for instance, the member companies on, on a joint target on how to reduce the methane footprint of their uh, scope one and two upstream operation. Then uh, last year, uh, we launched this, what we call the CCUS Kickstarter, uh, which, which aims to um, uh, enable and accelerate the development of CCUS hubs across, across the world. And again, please allow me to pause for the moment because it's going to be uh, expanded a little bit later uh, during the, um, the discussion. And after that, we for this year, we try to address uh, more extensively the carbon footprint of our upstream operation, but also um, launching a number of initiatives on transport. Um, each year we've tried to dedicate a significant amount of resources and energy to one thematic and then keep it, it uh, keeping it at high speed for the following years. So methane in 2018, CCUS in 2019, and 2020 is going to be the year of transport for us. So if you move on to the next slide, uh, you have is here uh, an explanation of what is our methane intensity target and what the, the, our member companies are committed to. So basically, uh, the methane emission sources from uh, the oil and gas uh, companies that are part of the OGCI is relatively low compared to the, uh, the, the, the industry average because collectively we only emit uh, 2 million of methane, roughly speaking. And uh, this represents 0.32% in 2017 uh, of methane emission across the gas that is reaching the market. The, the target that was defined was defined across all the upstream oil and gas operation. And so it's taking into account all methane emission divided by the quantity of gas that is reaching the market. If you move on to the next slide, what we try to achieve and what we've committed to is that we, uh, uh, we have a, co a collective target of reducing um, the uh, methane intensity by uh, one-fifth, i.e. from 0.32% to 0.25, as you can see on the graph on the left-hand side, and defining an ambition, i.e. we try to go a little bit further down than the target uh, to 0.2%. And for the moment, we are on a good trend to uh, achieve either our target or ambition. And beyond those actions that are directly tackling uh, the methane emission under the operational control of our member companies, we are also engaging on a series of actions uh, with uh, uh, external parties because we do believe that the methane issue is not only an issue for our own companies, but it's also an issue for the rest of the value chain and the rest of the gas value chain. So it's extremely important for us to secure the information and how what is the methane challenge, how, met, how much methane emission is emitted across the world. There is a lot of uncertainty around that. Where are the source points, how we can address them. And to do that, we need to collaborate with a number of external parties. That's what you've seen uh, in the left, in the right hand side, sorry, of this slide is that we have some joint program with uh, Environmental Defense Fund, EDF, or with the United Nations Environmental Program, uh, UNEP, on measurements. Uh, we also joined uh, an effort with university with Stanford uh, to assess what is the global methane budget. Uh, we support uh, work uh, done by the World Bank and um, on detecting flaring sources and quantity, quantity of flare across the world uh, using satellite data. 
So here we sponsor this kind of program. We also have a, a joint program with the UN on the, what is called the Global Methane Alliance. And we are the unique uh, private co coalition working with the UNEP and EBRD to uh, enable um, uh, methane targets uh, to be considered in the climate strategy in some countries, and particularly in the revision of their NDCs uh, toward the COP26, so the nationally determined contribution. So all of that action is aiming to make the methane at the center of the climate strategy. When it comes to the CCUS, as you can see on this slide, <clears throat> We try to enable hubs. So for those of you who are familiar with the with the CCUS, you probably know that this is a very uh, capital intensive um, uh, industry at the beginning, but it's also creating a lot of value and job uh, over the long run. And what we do believe is that in a way to reduce the cost, the upfront cost, is to mutualize uh, the cost of transport and storage by enabling a number of industry to plug in their emission sources toward this pipeline, for instance, and store it either on the underground or offshore. This is done in multiple hubs, and the CCUS Kickstarter initiative is aiming to um, uh, assess the potential feasibility of projects uh, in various industrial hubs, so generating, uh, capturing, sorry, CO2 emission from multiple industries and storing uh, into one common ground underground storage area. And we've done that for five hubs, uh, thanks to this Kickstarter, which is providing resources, uh, technical expertise, and also preliminary um, uh, support from our member companies directly. Uh, and we're going to scale up those projects and those hubs to a certain maturity level. And as soon as it's reached a certain maturity level, i.e. it has been de-risked uh, for the first phase, then it's going to be a takeover by either member companies, an external party, or GCICI, etc., etc. So the idea is really to scale up uh, the number of hubs as we progress. So last year, we launched the initiative. We had incorporated five hubs already across the world. And the idea for us is to expand this number of hubs uh, as we progress uh, with this initiative. If you move on to the next slide, we also have the activity of OGCICI within CCOS. So aside of the hubs that we are trying to scale up and to bring to a certain maturity level during the early stage of development, our fund is also, is also taking direct equity share into some project. So that's the case, for instance, uh, in Net Zero T-Side, which is a project that is aiming to uh, capture the CO2 emission from power generation based on gas, and also plug in other industries, as you can see on the schematic, to the same transportation pipeline and store the CO2 into an underground uh, storage area, which is located offshore of the uh, eastern part of the UK. We also have invested in Wabash Valley, which is um, another project that is uh, decarbonizing um, the CO2 emission associated with ammonia production. And this is one of the investments that we are doing in the US, because in the US, the policy mechanism in place, the 45Q, enable uh, a commercial model for a CCUS project, even when there is uh, one unique source of emission, like, the, like it's the case for the Wabash uh, Valley. Um, if you move on to the next slide, you'll see that the two other investments that OGCICI made for so far are also located in the US, thanks to this policy mechanism. So the importance of the work of OGCI uh, as a collective, as a group of um, to, to, uh, as a group of companies, to work with stakeholders and to work with government to set up the uh, enabling environment for such um, technology to happen, because we could imagine similar policy mechanism in other regions in the world. So I, I will not describe too much those two extra projects, but these are the two, uh, the two next ones. And the other action that we do on transport, so as you as you may remember, this was also one of the third uh, action plan that we try to to address is that for transport this year, we look at, the, again, the hard-to-scale-up solution, i.e. Um, how we can enable uh, the use and the expansion of low-carbon liquid fuel, so to um, make an incremental saving on existing thermal engine, so, and, and so get the ball rolling on the transport decarbonization, and particularly when it comes to heavy-duty vehicle. We we'll also look at how we can really make the case of low-carbon hydrogen as a viable transport fuel, with, a, again, a first a focus with the heavy-duty transport. And we also look at the marine transport and how, for instance, mobile carbon capture uh, could enable to reduce the carbon footprints of the marine transport. And then we also, um, again, um, continue to our work on CCUS, uh, uh, which is something I described already earlier. So if you please move on to the next slide. Um, 
this is my final slide. And it's just to illustrate as well what are the other investments that OGCICI has taken. So you, you've heard about the, the, the project that we've invested in, which are reminded at the bottom of the slide. But I just wanted to highlight the fact that we are also taking equity share into a number of startups that are capturing and enabling uh, the solution and the reduction of the sector that I mentioned earlier. So for instance, if I give you the example of the methane, we've invested in some technology that allow to detect methane leakage. That's the case for GGSAT, for instance. Then we have also invested into technologies that measure the methane leakage uh, rate, which is the case for CCOPS, for instance, and also investing into technology that mitigates uh, the methane um, emission, which is the case, for instance, for clack valves. Uh, and, and similarly, we do uh, some action in transport where we have invested into um, uh, North Power, which is providing a uh, low carbon solution for the marine transport or Excel fleet electrification, which looks at uh, decarbonizing the heavy duty uh, fleets of vehicle. Uh, so I hope that gives you a little bit of flavor of the type of action that we do. Of course, it's just an extract and a snapshot of, uh, of, a, party, uh, of a part of our activities. And I'm very happy to expand a little bit during the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. Um, I will give the microphone to Bernard Otto, who is going to tell us about Roxal needs energy transition. OK, um, so I will share my uh, PowerPoint now. So I hope you can see it. Can you? Yes, we can. Just a quick one before I start with my presentation. I'm a senior staff still employed by an oil company, oil and gas company here in Europe. Uh, but all the following statements are <clears throat> describe my own private opinion and do not necessarily describe the, uh, let's say, uh, view of my uh, employer. Okay, um, there is different energy transition scenarios. Consider the reutilization of pre-existing salt cavern storage infrastructure. The key question is, are these aging and shrinking salt caverns and the brittle overburden suitable for continued future utilization? Within my abstract, I've already listed some of the main subsurface risks associated with salt caverns. On page two of my abstract, you will also find another list about the G&G skills required to professionally deal with these risks. Today, this talk is centered around the third theme, which is staff responsibility. So let me first start with a quote from the book Geoethics by Papaloni and Di Capua, who wrote, um, it is important that geoscientists consider geoethics as an indispensable framework in which to base their training and activity. So emphasis is on framework and activity. On this slide, you find some more uh, quotes surprising quotes but i'm going to skip these today <clears throat> um, <clears throat> based on these observations the project team identified four common root causes of geoethical misconduct at the beginning of our project framing number one is limited willingness to detect potential risks second limited ability to appropriately communicate these detected risks. Third one is limited willingness to act or react responsibly and appropriately. And finally, but last but not least, the violation of globally accepted HSE compliance rules. A quote from the Equinor book, I stop unsafe behavior and activities. But finally, everything comes down to the question, where is my own responsibility? So let's not waste any time. Oops, Ella. Now we are in a different mode, sorry. Uh, I did not launch the user-specific presentation, so I need to skip. So um, to the right, you find a more generalized cross-section showing the main fault within the brittle overburden. 
Yellow salt caverns, uh, yellow salt caverns mark uh, gas caverns, whereas the brown ones are storing oil. <clears throat> the gas caverns, according to the Federal Institute of Geoscience and Natural Resources, are subject to elevated big cavern conversions. Furthermore, these gas caverns, due to the trading of gas, face multi-cyclical stress perturbances, which in turn may also reduce the breakdown pressure within the brittle overburden. So, Sorry to interrupt you. We can see to the right, in the top right, the chat as a gray box. You are able to put it lower. Oh, now it's gone. Uh, I, I thought it's just me who sees this. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Okay. Uh, so again, you see the uh, the main fault here uh, on top of the salt. Uh, you also see a small red arrow, uh, arrow which indicates the critically thin salt roof. Yeah, in between the viscoplastically moving or reacting salt, and on top the brittle overburden which behaves poroelastically. <clears throat> so the working hypothesis formulated by the project team is the main fault, which is critically stressed, may get reactivated. So why is it critically stressed? You see the uh, upper Cretaceous zone here, which is uh, constant, has a constant thickness. Uh, whereas then during tertiary times, this fault got reactivated. If you look very carefully, you can see this uh, very recent quaternary aged uh, depression, which also indicates sub erosion, which means in turn the fault zone has been hydraulically conductive. And that, according to Mark Zoback, it means that this fault zone is critically stressed because the friction coefficient within this fault zone is being reduced. <clears throat> Okay, next one. Uh, on this slide to the left, you see the uh, red polygon, which indicates the subsidence bowl. In between this uh, polygon, all the measurement points, so where fine leveling has been done, uh, had a subside yearly subsidence rate of more than 70 millimeters in 2018. <clears throat> The yellow line indicates the position of the main fault uh, defined by wellbore results only as no reliable seismic data exists. The grayish zone on both sides of the fault defines the zone in which stress perturbances within one well, for instance, due to work over, trigger stress perturbances within neighboring wells. So that means Whenever it comes to work over, it may stress the fault in between as well. <clears throat> Obviously, in any case of a fault reactivation, more than a dozen of oil wells and highly pressurized gas wells would be a direct risk with potentially devastating consequences. The nearest inhabitants are living in a short distance of 90 meters only, Consequently, the official safety margin is only 90 meters as well. Obviously, that's a bad joke. Um, I can skip that one, sorry. <clears throat> In order to further challenge or prove our working hypothesis, we carried out a transient analysis of the high precision, precision fine leveling data set one of only very few data sets publicly available. Shows the subsidence data for 53 measurement points out of almost 800. Where each of these 53 measurement locations showed at least one subsidence value of 70 millimeters or more over the shown period between 2012 and 2019, the x-axis. So except for the value in the upper left corner, all values are negative, 
which means no rise at all. So one often hears that the caverns are breathing, but these ones are not breathing because breathing is suggest an elastic movement. So a reversible movement. So all measurement points showed a downward movement. <clears throat> uh, when you, when, in, when we remove some artificially behaving locations, 46 time series remain. This is what you see, 46 overlapping curves. Uh, and these ones show a very characteristic downward movement of the whole overburden, not just the surface. To the left in 2012, you see small subsidences followed by accelerated downward movement from 2013 through 2015 with 10 centimeters subsidence in just one year. Again, followed by a calming down in 2016, followed by another accelerated abrupt downward movement and so forth. Obviously, as the coarse, quickly converging salt caverns and multicyclic gas trading is not going to disappear, this characteristic discontinuous disruptive downward movement is going to continue as well. So our prognosis looks like this one in contrast to the subsidence predictions done by the Federal Institute of Geoscience and Natural Resources in Hanover in Germany. Uh, they are, this is the German equivalent to Sanya. <clears throat> so there's quite a bit of a different thinking about the behavior of the overburden. <clears throat> so before I summarize my uh, presentation, let me quickly foreshadow what we intend to do. We definitely need to intensify an open and informed dialogue between the stakeholders and the affected population. We want to uh, convince stakeholders to actually apply globally accepted HSE compliance rules. Again, uh, the quote from the Equino book, I stop unsafe behavior and activities. I mention Equinor because Equinor operates 19 out of 51 converging salt caverns in this asset. Third point, we actually purchased already a Raspberry Shake, one of the more, to be able to monitor a potential salt falls and fault movement. Uh, we also consider utilization of densely sampled in-source satellite imagery to further analyze abnormal sort of surface subsidence, because with the fine leveling, we only get one value per year, whereas with inside, inside satellite imagery, we could do it on a monthly basis. Fifth point is to get uh, or to, to generate realistic 3D saw geomechanical models. That includes the poroelastic treatment of the overburden, and as well should include uh, discontinuities like faults. And finally, we want to convince stakeholders to actually acquire 3D seismic to locate the sword edges and potential tectonostratigraphic leakage pathways. Now, let me quickly summarize um, my presentation. We have an interesting and scary situation to quote an internationally highly regarded geomechanics expert. What really scares me is that all stakeholders refuse to react responsibly, appropriately, and in compliance with their own HSE rules. Again, quoting Equinor, I stop unsafe behavior and activities. But reliance and refusal is not HSE compliant. Instead, this attitude is actually what kills the credibility of the oil and gas business credibility that is needed to raise public acceptance to make the energy transition happen. So this is where I'm finished. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Renat. The next person is the Professor Esberry Flower. He will talk to us about basalt carbon sequestration. Professor, can you How do I yourself? Thank you so much.
I'm going to ask all the other audience to mute themselves because some people are interfering. Video. Yes. Can you see me and hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Yep. Okay. Good. Um, well, thank you for um, letting me present some of our activities related to uh, carbon sequestration in, in volcanics. It's uh, uh, Volcanic Basin Petroleum Research is really a company that works in between research and exploration of a volcanic basin and volcanic rifted margins. Uh, we apply our knowledge uh, in, mainly to the hydrocarbon industry, but we also work on geothermal energy and uh, in basic research, basically on how we generate greenhouse gases and what happens if you emit large volumes of greenhouse gases into the uh, to the atmosphere and hydrosphere, basically triggering some of these um, uh, major mass extinction in Earth history, such as uh, the end uh, Permian extinction uh, 250 million years ago, or the what we call the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum about um, 55 million years ago that was associated with magmatism in the Northeast Atlantic. We have access to a, to a large volume of high quality seismic data. So what you see in the background here on this image is basically the top basalt surface that's been mapped on the mid Norwegian continental margin. So you see a scale here of a few kilometers. These escarpments is about a kilometer high and we can see lava flows that, that flowed uh, from the west into the basin and uh, uh, hitting a paleo coastline about 55 million years ago. And we tried to understand the internal architectures and reservoir properties of these basalt sequences. So basically the theme of the talk is why do we want to do carbon capture and storage in, in, in basalts? Obviously it's, it's to mitigate uh, the future climate change and, and uh, to the 1.5 or 2 degree um, temperature in, increase. Um, so this curve here from the IPCC shows basically time on the, on the x-axis and then uh, the, the net CO2 emissions in gigatons or picograms uh, CO2. So about, four, uh, about 40 gigatons of annual emissions now um, in 2020. Uh, we basically need to go somewhat to a net um, or to, to about the zero net emission of, of, of zero or less than zero uh, gigatons per year by, by 2050. Um, and to fulfill this, uh, this uh, scenario, um, most reports and, and, and studies uh, suggest that, uh, that we need to do carbon capture and, and, and storage to fulfill these two degree targets. Uh, so, so perhaps that we might have to to to, to store something about uh, 50 50 percent of the emissions in the 21st century. However, today the, the volumes of CO2 that's being stored is really is uh, uh, very very small. So, so all of the current uh, type of um, test projects is small compared to the to to the target we want in the futures. Some of the sequestration targets would be like biosphere. We can store CO2 in the ocean. We can store it in aquifers. We can store it petroleum fields. But what we are going to talk, discuss today is how you can store um, CO2 in, in rocks. There's a lot of challenges related to, to, to this, both in terms of engineering and investment costs. If you reaction rates, uh, we are concerned about uh, the reservoir properties, so the permeability and potential plugging, clogging, and of course access to large volumes of, of CO2, particularly if you work in, in large areas. In this uh, IAA report from, from 2016, 
they they sort of claim that we we need we we need to store something like 52 gigatons of CO2 between 2015 to 2040. This uh, scales to about 2,000 CCS projects uh, of, of 25 megatons, so like Sleipner's type. So, if you think about CO2 in basalts, what many people think about basalts as, as very sort of massive crystalline rocks uh, with only type of fracture porosity and permeability. But basalts um, that are extruded on the on the surface can also be very porous and have high permeability. It's just an example here from the Carpix project on in in Iceland, where they are currently um, sequestering CO2. So we see a vesicular basalt here. It's a large open pore spaces. You can also see that is a fracture cutting through with where you get carbonate uh, 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 precipitated in in these fractures. So we have a carbonatization reaction when um, you get the carbon and from from the CO2, but you have calcium or magnesium uh, coming from uh, from from the actual rock. Um, uh, very good examples of, of high permeability um, basalt reservoirs. So one example is in the Columbia River flood basalt in the western US. So a large part of the agriculture industry here relies on, on water that's being produced from this high permeability and high porosity um, basalt horizons in this part of the world. And it's particularly the flow tops that are high permeability and high porosity reservoirs. In the deep water, we can have CO2 as supercritical um, fluids so that we don't only deal with the gas. So one of the main sort of study areas and research that we are working on is, is on the mid, uh, is, is on the uh, European uh, continental margins. So basically from northern Norway, this is Lofoten, it's called the Vöring uh, uh, Plateau, the Möre, but also the Faroes and the west of Shetland. In this part we have this very classical sort of zebra dipping reflections. So this is up to six kilometer thick successions of severely erupted basalts that are located um, along the margin and close to these continent ocean transitions. Um, so this is just an example from the inner part of these areas where we here basically here see uh, a more than one kilometer thick succession of basalts imaged on seismic data. So in the upper part here, these would be lava flows. These prograding sequences are hyaloclastites. So in a short summary, like basalt terminated volcanic sequences, they widespread along the outer part of the Norwegian continental shelves. The water depths of these um, areas is typically like uh, one to two and a half kilometers. Um, you have multiple reservoirs um, that can be used for, for, for carbon storage, both intra-basalt and sub-basalts. And we also have nice seals um, of marine clay at top of this Paleocene uh, and earliest Eocene age volcanic rocks. But just we, we also have this uh, advantage here when you work in the, these uh, areas that have been acquired high quality industry standard 3D seismic reflection data. So this is just a, a cube. This is would be about uh, uh, 30 kilometers um, in, in this direction, about uh, 40 kilometers in this direction here. Um, and what we see here is the top basalt surface. And then we see imaged here it, what is what we call the seaward dipping uh, reflections. And we know that these represent basalts because um, in 1985, it was drilled a one kilometer deep hole through this volcanic succession by the ocean drilling program. It's a famous uh, ODP site 642. It's situated at this locality. So basically here we have 100 lava flows in this part. 
and then we have uh, um, some uh, volcanic classic sediments and then we go into what's called a lower series which is a mix of of, of seal intrusions and um, and um, volcanic um, flows so if you just from the 3d seismic data we can calculate sort of multiple reservoirs in in this unit so here it's basically six different main uh, reservoir type of units or basalt units we, we map out the extent of each of them the thicknesses of it and then the volumes so of course in in, in the, the the volumes here of, of, of rock that you can uh, sequester co2 in is, is is very large you talk about numerous uh, cubic kilometers yeah so for a conventional ccs plant we only need something like uh, 0 0.1 cubic kilometer so the potential to store co2 into the basalts is enormous the practicalities is of course something very different um if you just look um, on again just the uh, um, criteria applied to basalt on a Norwegian continental shelf if if this is a um, um, favorable or unfavorable conditions we see that the basalt really are a favorable type of locality so we have multiple stacked reservoirs we have a potential for monitoring fluid leakage uh, these areas are very remotely lo uh, located so it's a large distance to human activity it's low seismicity in these regions, limited faulting and fracturing. The water depths are at large, um, fairly low uh, geothermal um, um, gradients, um, significant reservoir thickness. Locally, we might have good porosity and permeability, both for the reservoir and cap rocks. So this is the sort of scenarios that we are working on. And as just uh, to round off this sort of very brief overview presentations. So basically here we have the reservoir sequences in the, the severely erupted basalt. You can inject um, the CO2 at multiple targets within the lava flows or below it. Then we have a good seal that is marine clay and we have ample opportunities to do monitoring of potential leakage from this type of, of reservoirs. Um, our big concerns and areas that needs to be worked out in the, to, to make this any reality is that the access to CO2, uh, the type of reaction rates and how much we and the pumping rates we ha have in, in a way with the reservoir permeability and clogging and obviously all the issues relating to the engineering and, and the cost of these type of projects. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to give the floor to Walker, who will tell us about maturing geothermal energy for Saudi Arabia. Good. And hello, everybody. I will try and share my screen. Sorry for that. So, can you see my screen? Energy transitions and Ever? Yes. Okay, so welcome. My name is Volker Farnkamp. I'm a professor at Kaus University in Saudi Arabia. And I thank you very much for uh, the opportunity uh, to, to talk in this event. So, um, you know, what, what we were thinking of, uh, if we endeavor into energy transition, um, then uh, our talk was concentrating on maturing geothermal energy for Saudi Arabia. And here's my co-authors and also the geothermal conference participants have contributed with many of their ideas. So if you think about uh, geothermal energy in Arabia, I'd like to ask you what, what comes to your mind, really, 
uh, in terms of geothermal or even renewable energy. And most likely, you know, probably nothing. And uh, that is true because uh, in Arabia itself, there so far have been um, uh, no real serious geothermal efforts. So, you know, we, uh, we, uh, and, and uh, this is, we can see this here on the geothermal installed capacity. And if you look at Arabia, there's nothing. That was in 2015, but it hasn't changed today. So, we came up at KAUST, we, we do research conferences, and we came up with the idea to run a geothermal conference on maturing geothermal energy for Saudi Arabia. We had about 100 participants from 48 countries in Europe, Asia, Australia, and the Americas. We had a lot of uh, Saudi visitors. There were academics, industry, and government people there, and of course, a lot of our students. Uh, this is the way we, we run this. And um, so our conference goals were in to ask, can geothermal energy be matured economically to provide a substantial contribution to the future energy supply? And I think economics, you know, you will hear this again and again through the presentation, play an important role, especially also with the economic down dip that we're seeing right now, because you know the, the purses will be tighter to finance energy transitions. Now, in Saudi Arabia, specifically or in other Arabian countries, can life-sustaining water desalination and air conditioning be run by geothermal energy? You know, in Arabia, we need water, and there's definitely not enough water around for the populations and the lifestyle. We need air conditioning. Can geothermal uh, help in this? So, so right now, in almost everywhere in, in, in Arabia, all energy comes from hydrocarbons. Uh, slowly but surely, uh, solar PV uh, uh, comes in and, and makes a contribution, but it's really minute. Um, Desalination and air conditioning consumes about 30% of the energy that is consumed in the, in the country. So transportation uh, and other electricity needs. But all of this comes from hydrocarbons. So any drop of water, any air conditioning burns hydrocarbons and produces CO2. And on top of this, there are rapidly growing populations and industrialization is going on. So the energy use will, will rise definitely. So, you know, the question then was, is geothermal energy the sleeping giant in the renewable energy field to make a dent into this? And, you know, I, um, I would like to uh, give a few highlights from the conference uh, that is extracted from many different presentations that were given there. And, uh, and uh, well, there were many more, but uh, I, I just give you the highlights. So here, let's have a look a little bit at the regional geological setting, because we need to know geology if we want to do geothermal. And uh, you see Arabia here, the outline of Arabia. We have the deep sedimentary aquifers in the rift basins at the western margin uh, towards the Red Sea. We have areas of volcanic activity. We have shield granites uh, at the surface and, and buried. And then, of course, towards the east, we have the passive margin deep sedimentary aquifers that also host all the hydrocarbons, which are mainly um, concentrated around here. OK, now we'll have a quick look at this cross section. and. Uh, you know, I put this together, it's not to scale from different presentations. But, you know, here on this side, we see the Red Sea Rift Basins, onshore basins uh, with uh, exceeding five kilometers in depth. Here's the Arabian Shield that gives opportunities for hot, dry rock, geothermal. And then here we have the Arabian platform with many depositional layers, uh, which have uh, many, many stacked aquifers in them. So uh, we learned in the conference that the range of geothermal gradients is 30 to 35 degrees, uh, sometimes exceeding this, you know, all the way up to more than 50 degrees uh, per kilometer. So this is in the in in this mainly in this area 
in the southwest of Saudi Arabia. We have sedimentary basins and stacked aquifers uh, exceeding in depth to five kilometers, and there's potential for hot dry rock and high and low enthalpy geothermal. So that's the geological settings, and from from this, uh, there, from the, all the ideas, there were there are some tentative follow-up projects. Okay, uh, and I summarize this here. I say tentative because everything needs to be financed and tender and so forth. That all takes time. And this conference took place in January 2020, so it's probably one of the few research conferences that will ever be run in the year of 2020 in person. Well, anyway, we have one spin-off here that is between Aramco and Siemens that it was triggered by this. I won't talk about this any further. Here's a timeline because you also need to think about, you know, project deliveries, et cetera. So here, what I show is a two-legged project approach between government agency, mainly KCARE, and a number of universities, uh, KAUS and KFUPM, perhaps being the leaders. So here is, is a project that is in tender stage or, or being prepared for tender stage that is mapping uh, the geothermal potential of Saudi Arabia and then also uh, do a technology screening, which technologies are possible where and, and what might work. So this will take a few years for project delivery. In the meantime, we are, uh, we, are, we are working on realizing geothermal pilots. And there's four of them that are on the radar. One is uh, hot dry rock. This is essentially done by the Saudi Geological Survey. But then there are also high enthalpy and low enthalpy geothermal projects that are uh, planned for or, or earmarked for the West Coast and, uh, and the East Coast. So if we would want, if we actually get the financing and all of this uh, worked up here, there'll be an exploration phase followed by drilling. Right? The exploration phase um, uh, requires seismic, etc. Uh, then there will be drilling, there'll be a test phase. And if the aquifers are confirmed and everything is running well and the temperatures are there, chemistry is favorable, then we would drill twin wells that would be a test phase two for long-term fluid circulation, and there will be a test phase three for CO2 injection to run CPG. And I would, uh, in the next few slides, I will uh, go a little bit deeper in, into uh, these technologies that are behind it and why we, are, we got all very excited about this. So one of, one of, uh, uh, one of the key uh, developments that we or, or, or points that we got out of conference is that key technology drivers will drive the economics of these projects. So here we get one for low enthalpy geothermal, and and this is a technology that is actually uh, being developed in in a Kaust uh, uh, research center. And that is uh, advanced heat exchangers or a MEDAT circle. So that's a multi-effect distillation, adsorption, and dis uh, desalination process. So here we get the geothermal uh, uh, heat or the geothermal water. And then uh, there's uh, this multi-effect distillation and an additional or additional cycles of adsorption cycles are added to this to uh, basically extract more energy from this. And that increases the efficiency of these desalination plants significantly to make it more economic. And that makes it very attractive already at relatively low temperatures. Um, another another uh, 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 method that, we, uh, that is a key technology driver uh, is the geothermal CCUS. So, you know, and, and the key here is on the U. So we utilize the carbon that is being produced. And this is an idea that uh, is basically hatched by or was presented by the ETH Zurich Geothermal Energy and Geofluids Group by Professor Martin Saar and his collaborators and, and, uh, and the guys from Siemens. 
So the CO2 is captured, it's compressed, it's injected into the subsurface uh, where, it, where it forms uh, uh, or accumulates basically below a cap rock and it's taking up the heat of the reservoir and then it's being reproduced uh, to generate power and then it's being re-injected, the cold one, together with the additional one. So it's a CCS and utilization, a true CCUS. Okay, so why CCUS? Why would that be uh, favorable in, in Saudi Arabia? So here we have a CO2 emissions map uh, for Saudi Arabia. We were producing about 400 million metric tons of, uh, of uh, CO2 annually with a growth rate of 3.5%. And these are the main uses. Uh, it's for desalination, electricity, petrochemical, refinery steel, etc. So the desalination and electricity, which is mainly taking place here at the coastal areas, where, uh, where the, where the uh, industrial centers are and the population centers, this is uh, uh, per perhaps replaceable uh, from these uh, deep stacked uh, aquifers with geothermal energy. Plus we can capture the CO2 from this and utilize it for uh, the process. So um, this is a very exciting new technology that, uh, that could come in and, and uh, both help to uh, lower the need to burn hydrocarbons, but also make a dent into, um, into uh, the CO2 that is being produced. So, you know, I, I talked, uh, well, 12, 12 minutes now. Uh, the question was geothermal energy in Arabia, you know, what comes to your mind? Well, I hope now that you will have uh, many opportunities that, that come to your mind now. It is in line with the Saudi vision of uh, 50 plus gigawatt renewables by 2000, 2030, and it supports the Saudi and global climate goals. And um, I'd like to conclude here with a few images from the conference. And I'd like to, again, thank all the participants in the in the conference that have uh, brought their ideas and were perhaps part of the kickstarting of this uh, this journey in Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. I will give the floor to Giovanni, socio from the Slumberger, who will tell us about the integration between geothermal and digitalization. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. I don't know if I'll share my slides. You'll tell me if you see them. We can see it now. Okay, I'll just dock my chat so it doesn't uh, cover the slide. So thanks for the opportunity to present. I'm actually uh, here to present someone else's uh, presentation or cooperative work by my colleague Alex Burachok and uh, in cooperation with another colleague, Matthias Zoig, a reservoir engineer and a geologist from our um, office in Hanover. Uh, but unfortunately, Alex couldn't do it today, so he's asked me to, to replace and present this work. So this is, um, of course, just an example in, in the topic of the, in today's workshop. Uh, it's possibly part of the creative ideas or maybe the successful projects. It's just the point of view of a service company, of an oilfield service company, and in particular of our division, which is a software provider, on how to make the technologies that uh, are commonly used in the oil and gas um, industry, and in particular for the, in the geosciences in the characterization, available to the geothermal industry. So as potentially one uh, means of uh, uh, accompanying or um, facilitating the energy transition from, again, from our point of view. So it's, it's an example that I will present. And um, again, on behalf of my colleagues, and what I would say, echoing what, uh, what Paula had said in the introduction, um, I sort of wish to dedicate this uh, today's presentation to those in the oil and gas industry that might have taken the current situation uh, in the worst uh, 
possible ways, people that have lost their jobs or lost their activity because of the situation we're incurring. And hope, hoping, of course, that the energy transition might also ease that, uh, that situation to many of our colleagues in, the, in this industry. So what will I present today? It's an example um, of the move of moving to the cloud, our software, our modeling software solution, and how this can be applied to geothermal uh, site modeling uh, projects. So what was the traditional way? And again, I'm happy that some of my, some fellows from the industry, uh, including software vendors are attending this conference and some of the people that, uh, that I've seen in this same fora and uh, especially in the AG. I would just uh, move from what we could call the traditional modeling. So what is the traditional way of doing modeling? Separate uh, workstation for separate uh, geoscientists of engineer. Each one would have his or her own um, software with their own version, with their own data storage, and the transfer between one and the other might or might not be done smoothly, if possible at all. We know, uh, including the geothermal project, we often see uh, different pieces of work, different work packages that are done in a way that cannot communicate to each other, data which are included only qualitatively from one phase to the other because of the impossibility to, to transfer it from one software to the other. And even when the software are shared, uh, different versions, issues with data transfer, are uh, still quite common or still occurring. Of course, the first step, which is something that we has been done widely in the petroleum industry, but it's taken on also in the geothermal, in some geothermal projects by consultants and operators, is the idea to have platforms uh, from the software point of view and having a corporate or a company approach by which several uh, scientists and engineers share a uh, software platform and can share some projects uh, through different domains. So facilitating the transfer of the data, but still having the issue of data management and data storage. How do we share the data from different workstations, from different users? How do we manage the infrastructure in terms of hardware, in terms of software licensing, in terms of, again of data management across uh, across an organization. And this again is a step forward. We uh, have been proposing, and I will briefly present it, we've been working on uh, on an integrated modeling for a geothermal project. I think it's been presented elsewhere, so I won't spend too much time on it. So how is this carried out and how many people uh, would need to join a project which is already integrated in a way? So in this case, it was a project that we've done in France in which moving from all the data that was made available to characterize the site, we first looked at the log data or the well data to build petrophysical interpretation, image log uh, interpretation for fractures, and mechanical earth model. And this, of course, was done by the petrophysicists, the log analyst, the geomechanics engineer on the 1D data. We, the, then the structural geologist stepped in. It took the image data and the structural model and using a tectonic approach, tectonic based approach, build a discrete fracture network. From this, uh, we moved then to the geophysics, the interpretation and inversion of the seismic data done by the geophysicist. Then all this together, the petrophysical interpretation, the fracture network, the inversion were used to populate the properties across the geological model by the reservoir geologist. The model was then uh, calibrated or history matched with the well test data by the reservoir engineer who built the flow and heat flow model, fluid flow and heat flow, to predict the behavior of the doublet. Here we can see the cool uh, water front uh, radiating from the injector towards the producer well. And finally, this was coupled with the geomechanical model that was built previously to estimate the the change in stress and the fault reactivation and the seismicity occurred in the uh, in the, uh, especially along the fault but in the project so all this is a already from our point of view from software and consulting uh, point of view it's already very integrated it's quite advanced in terms of how 
the different uh, pieces of the workflow were done together, but still they were done by at least five or six different um, engineers on different that would typically work on separate machines with different data storage. The petrophysicist, the geomechanics engineer, geologist, geophysicist, uh, reservoir engineer, etc. So what could be the next step? And this is what we've um, we've tried to apply to geothermal um, to geothermal project, at least to discuss with geothermal customers. Is the idea of uh, moving from this uh, siloed approach with different uh, workstation and different software to a unified uh, environment based on the cloud in which the tools, the software tools, are shared by all the um, all the experts, all the petrophysical, uh, sorry, the petrotechnical uh, engineers. The storage is common, so the data is stored commonly for access by all the people. And of course, um, the uh, access to the software and to the data is constant, is available all the time. There's no downtime, there's no time zone, there's no location issues, and the version of the software is always kept to the more recent. This is not new. This is the approach that any uh, software vendor on the cloud is pursuing. But what we try to see is the applicability of this to uh, to geothermal to the geothermal market. So this is just to describe what the Schlumberger solution is from from the point of view of the company we work for. So the software is here. The software is made available on the cloud. Again, uh, this would be, from our point of view, the traditional software that uh, that we've always used, the Petrel, for example, as a platform, is made available on the cloud. And it's linked, of course, to the engines or the simulators that are used still on the cloud to make the most um, intensive uh, calculations, together eventually with tools that are developed specifically on the cloud, for example, for data analytics. So this is the software environment that is available on the cloud based on a data ecosystem. We've uh, we said before the liberated data, something where the data is available to all the software environment directly without the need to import export into the single, uh, into the different packages. And of course, this data ecosystem is made in such a way that a variety of input data uh, can be ingested from the more structured data to the more uh, structured such as reports or uh, public databases uh, and uh, the separate software projects can be brought in. So this is a bit of the framework that we have built. And mm, I try to basically transition from our traditional software offering into something which is based on the cloud. What are the advantages that are possible for uh, geothermal projects and what have we already tried uh, in that sense? So one example, which is mostly for the reservoir engineers, is the idea of uh, speeding up the decision making by accounting more easily for the uncertainty and the risk, so that we, uh, the traditional, my traditional, the approach in the oil and gas industry, which is to evaluate and quantify the uncertainty, and running several scenarios to account for this uncertainty and quantify it, is typically limited by the availability of the infrastructure. The idea of having a workflow like this in the cloud is that not only the data, the input data, which you can see more to the to the left of the slides, are easily available through the cloud, including regional information, public databases, which are accessible through our cloud. But then on the other end of the, of the workflow towards the, the right, once the models are built, the simulations of the fluid and heat flow can be run with several scenarios in multiple realization without having the need to commit the, the hardware, the petrotechnical computing infrastructure that would otherwise have to be secured, bought, or rented. So the idea is that these multiple realizations that allow to quantify the uncertainty and therefore the risk, the project, can be accessed through the clouds, which is more flexible and less expensive. Another hybrid example is the idea of having simulation done on demand, but starting from on-premise uh, geological modeling. So the model is done traditionally by the engineer on their 
computer with a traditional software package. And then it is the simulation, uh, the fluid flow, the heat flow simulation, eventually the geomechanics, or even the wellbore performance simulations, which are done on the cloud. So the most intensive part of the workflow in terms of uh, infrastructure is done uh, on the cloud. And this is a way basically to make more intense or more complicated um, computations to be accessible uh, to uh, at a lower cost to operators that are willing to do that. This is not only uh, already widely used by the oil and gas industry, but we have geothermal uh, customers, uh, geothermal um, consultants in, in particular in Europe that have already used this to do their uh, thermal hydraulic simulation. Another thing which can be counted as an advantage is the access uh, to the central cloud uh, environment by basically any sort of remote devices. Um, the, uh, an example that we have here uh, is a work that we've done. This picture is from real geothermal operators office. I won't name them, but you can see that basically to run uh, an integrated workflow similar to the one that I was presenting a few slides ago, uh, they will, were managing to use their office laptop with uh, specifications in terms, for example, of active memories that would typically be unsuitable for the, for, for the software platform that they were using. So in this case, it was a quarter of the minimum recommended memory and still the workflow was run successfully because it was run through the cloud. So this is a way to um, secure that the existing, the available infrastructure can be used for more complex project without any investment in hardware. I would just move to the conclusion since the, and I'm sorry, this has been maybe a bit fast, uh, but uh, just to summarize, we've already seen a move forward by showcasing and seeing integrated models from the geology to the fluid and heat flow to the geomechanics to be applied in the, in the geothermal industry. And the idea of using common uh, software platform where these are integrated already reduces the loss of information across different steps and can facilitate the, the idea of evaluating uncertainties and risks in a more consistent and quantitative fashion. But then the next step would be to do the same type of uh, workflow, but with a reduced cost of ownership. So no infrastructure cost, no hardware and reduced software costs with the availability of flexible uh, computing power, which means having the possibility of storing uh, data and uh, making complex calculation only when this is needed without having to purchase the, the computers, basically the hardware to do it. And also the possibility of having hybrid solutions, such as the one that I presented for uh, simulation on demand, where a more traditional approach where the operator would own, for example, the modeling software is uh, associated with the possibility of running specific tasks, heat and flow simulations or wellbore uh, performance simulations uh, on a cloud uh, environment. So reducing the, the cost for this type of uh, applications. Again, this is one example uh, in out of several in which the oil and gas industry is trying to help the thermal uh, industry, helping try to pass the technology on to the geothermal industry. There are workshops which are set up for this purpose. So it's not, uh, my, my talk with Sla is far from being exhaustive, but I hope that I gave a good example and that is uh, inspiring to some. And again, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions later when at the end of the session. Thank you so much, Giovanni, for some questions. Um, we will go to Benjamin, and after that, we will open the floor for some questions. But I want to thank you already to all the speakers that have been brilliant. The, um, Benjamin organized with me this session, and he will give us the, the following steps. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good, good. Uh, and see, I have two screens. Can you see the presentation in full screen now or not? 
you are full of screen now. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, yes, uh, thanks a lot for uh, all the presentations. Um, I think we, we learned quite a bit on the big variety of topics dealing with uh, energy transition. So, um, as, as some, some of you already realized, we have there the chat to the right where you can ask questions for later on. We soon come to the question and answer section. Uh, yeah, so you can, uh, there are, uh, have already some questions been addressed and we can, um, we ca you can uh, ask, uh, uh, write them down now or we will open the microphone very soon for, uh, so you're allowed to ask questions. So, okay, before that, I just quickly want to conclude uh, the session and make a community invitation. My name is uh, Benjamin Badewald. I'm a senior geologist at Volcanic Basin Petroleum Research in Oslo. And I'm also a member in the EAG uh, uh, special interest community on uh, energy transition and decarbonization. Good, just, I really, I, I, I keep it very short. Basically, there is one rather technical slide, it's not even so technical. So energy transition and decarbonization, they're uh, urgent and uh, measures, they should be taken immediately. The figures I compiled here, the first one to the left, that shows you the, how the European newspaper covered um, uh, the articles or the attention on climate change and glo or global warming. Okay, this, it's as I mentioned here in the title, it's on climate change and global warming. It's not exactly the same as uh, energy transition and decarbonization, but I'm quite sure it would look very similar. What we see in this curve, is that the um, newspapers, uh, in this case, it's European newspapers. If you go to the, this uh, Center for Science and Technology uh, from University of Colorado, you can find the newspapers um, collections for all, all over the world. But what we see that, okay, the, the media attention, they, they quite fluctuated uh, when it comes to attention on these topics. We had a very high attention in at around 2010, 2016, both related to uh, climate summits and uh, governmental uh, panels. And luckily, in a way, we got a lot more attention on these topics from 2018 onwards. But now, 2020, we had the COVID-19 case. So related to that, this dropped quite significantly. Uh, however, uh, we should not wait now. Uh, this is uh, hopefully uh, COVID-19 we're uh, soon uh, hopefully soon over with it and uh, our efforts in uh, climate uh, or energy transition should not be delayed by this so um, so even if we have a drop in articles uh, and media attention we should all be trying to be as active as possible and push uh, new ideas and solutions as much as we can the figure to the right then, because this is from a climate, uh, from a carbon brief, that's an organization that communicates uh, climate, uh, climate change. And they show that if we do not act rapidly, so if we fail to drop uh, the, the, if we fail to drop the emissions, then uh, within eight years, we will be, not, we have reduced all the, the CO2 that is to be used to fulfill the 1.5 degree carbon threshold. So we have really to, we have to act quick and uh, we're not in a position to wait with this. Okay, one way to uh, inform yourself about all of this is uh, EAG and the, this special interest community on, uh, on uh, decarbonization and energy transition. So if you, if you like to get um, more information about our events, about published uh, articles that we uh, share, or also you can contribute yourself, then please follow us on the LinkedIn webpage. We have one from the special interest community. Or if you have more specific questions, you can also ask uh, our um, president. So Karin Debosch, she's um, uh, heading this uh, special interest community. You can uh, contact her or also uh, Paula or me, and we will be happy to, uh, to uh, respond to your uh, emails and deal with the, the questions. Because we, I think we all, we, we want you, and uh, it would be nice to, the community is growing quite a bit. I don't know, I think we have around 500 followers at the moment on LinkedIn. 
for that we are quite a young group that's quite impressive but still we want more followers and uh, join us on this exciting adventure uh, just to promote some upcoming events um yeah the 82nd annual eag meeting was postponed to december uh, it's going to be uh, still held in amsterdam and in the netherlands so in a way this what we did now was just to keep the spirits high on uh, energy transition that's why we did this video conference on the same week however please still join us uh, in this session it's uh, session 813 dedicated session 813 on energy transitions and endeavor and we're going to get more detailed presentations and we're going to have an open panel discussion in the end as well so please keep uh, this date uh, the afternoon of the 9th of december free and uh, in case you uh, make it to amsterdam join us another conference that uh, is organized kind of by this uh, special interest community is uh, get 2020 it's something quite new it's the first uh, geoscience and engineering uh, conference for energy transition and it's going to be held in uh, Strasbourg in France from the 16th to the 18th of November and this conference uh, covers quite a big broad um, a variety of topics uh, dealing with geoscience and engineering so from the classical one CCS and geothermal over to energy storage uh, solutions in society and government and also dealing with cross uses and disciplines um, we really um, welcome you to submit abstracts for this conference. However, the deadline is end of June. So in the spirit of uh, yeah, to act rapidly, as mentioned before, maybe you make it uh, in one month to write an abstract, an extended abstract, and submit it to this conference. In case you have questions, you find plenty of information on uh, get2020.org, and Giovanni and both Karin, they're both very actively involved in that conference. Okay, so that was it from my side. Um, we head now over the, to this question and uh, answer section. And I think we're going to do this uh, following the talks. So, uh, Paula, you have, uh, can you hear me? Or you want to introduce question for the first talks? No, I think we, we can open the floor for people. I have already a few questions. I already have some questions. Yeah. But to, to ask questions. Yeah. I just. I think we have the option to raise the hand. There are also some questions on the on the chat. Uh, I know there are some for me. Um, yes. You tell me if I should take them or. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, I'll try. I'll try to read through the questions. So thanks for uh, for the question that were asked. Um, so I think the the first one was coming. From uh, from Bernvard, so he was asking actually two questions on how this uh, cloud-based uh, environment works. So the first question is whether the modeling can still be done within Petrel, but based on the cloud. The answer is yes. So the idea is that the same software that uh, today we're using on uh, on our computer is now available on the cloud. That's the basic uh, way to put it. So the same software is used on the on a cloud-based. Uh, environment so you don't have to have the, the same specifications on your own, your, own, your own machine. Of course, hybrid solutions are possible, as I mentioned, so you can have it on your machine and then part of the workflows are run on the cloud. And some applications are being developed directly on the cloud now so that the, um, you, you could have more capabilities than the standard Petrel available on uh, on your on 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 premise as we say so on your machine and the second question on whether two people can work on the same petrol project yes that's also the idea i don't know how uh, this is happening in the current version i know it's been tested that two people work simultaneously on one project so that collaboratively edits the same objects on the one same project uh, i don't know if this is the way it's working on the on the commercial release but the idea is that one project is anyway shared by several uh, by several people whether this is concurrently I'll, i would have to check but the idea ultimately is to develop something similar to what is done when for example people edit a text file today on word and they can do it together 
and uh, simultaneously on uh, OneDrive. That's somehow the same approach that we had into. And the second question I've had was for from Phil. Phil was asking if the data format issues were solved uh, in the workflow I described. So I assume you were referring, Phil, to the workflow that I presented. From that one, that was still done traditionally, uh, in which the data were uploaded in the in the, in the old way, and so the, the data format would have to be fitting the ways that each and every application, uh, notably Paternal, would have uh, to uh, to load the data. One of the advantage of the transition to the cloud, so to, to Delphi in our case, is that we have developing, uh, we keep developing ways to ingest the data uh, in such a way that it can be made available to the software, such as Delphi, uh, such as Petrel, sorry, but the data are treated by uh, directly in the cloud by some advanced uh, uh, tools that did not exist in Petrel, but it are developed so that unstructured data, for example, reports or data which do not have a, a precise format can be loaded and then made available for usage by the by the software. So even if the data is not structured, it can be loaded uh, and um, made available for use in, uh, in the software. I don't know if that's what you meant, Phil. If not, feel free to get back to me. Okay. Those were the questions from my side. Uh, any other questions? I mean, from the chat, if someone addressed a question in the chat and wants to speak up, I think it's easier to. There, I see Ibrahim has quite a long question. So, if um, or, or uh, topic there to address, if someone you can uh, speak up here, so I think it's easier to do it that way. Yes, yeah, so perhaps in the meantime, we, before we collect somebody, this is Volker. I saw a number of questions or comments uh, coming in from, from Grant Walsh in, in Canada and, and so forth about CO2 availability, uh, right? So, you know, I, I, I think you, you saw this in the map in Saudi that there was an effort by my colleague Hussein Hotait, uh, you know, to have reliable maps of the sources of CO2, yeah, and not only it's you know not all CO2 is equal to CO2 right so that there's clean CO2 there's dirty CO2 mixed with other gases so that's very important because it it, it you know if we want to do CCUS which I think is is you know the the U to make it economic we have to utilize this carbon it's an asset right so and and we need to find ways to make carbon utilization um uh, economic on its own just about right so that 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 we really have uh, make money and create opportunities with this but the source for co2 uh, the 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 transport of the co2 to the sites where the ccus is going to go and take place is of key importance so it is a good idea to look around sources of co2 for uh, for places to store it and to utilize it to minimize transport costs. Thank you so much. I have a question for Julian. Uh, Julian, what happened with you? Work with the major companies. Uh, actually, I don't know if Julian is connected. Yeah. Yeah. You work with the majors, but what happened if a middle or a small oil and gas company want to want to hear about your initiative and want to get closer? Uh, thanks, thanks, Ingrid. Actually, we have a number of um, we have a number of other companies uh, knocking on the door uh, to to join the OGCI. So we want to collaborate with them because th the thing is that OGCI is quite a demanding initiative, both uh, financially and technically, and also it requires quite a significant involvement of uh, the expert and the CEO of the member company. So generally speaking, when you accumulate the criteria, it starts to be quite difficult, I guess, for a middle or small companies to be a, an official number. However, we have a number of uh, collaboration um, initiative on specific topics. So of course, we always welcome uh, any ideas on that that, that spirit and, and working with with companies who want to work with us. That's that's always uh, very much welcome. 
Okay, I, I have a question here from uh, Rodrigo uh, Oropesa, who wasn't quite clear on how to use CO2 for geothermal. So if I may answer this, and, and I'm really not the expert on this, uh, there, are, there are others, as I mentioned in, in the ETH or so, but essentially uh, you, you, you inject uh, CO2 in the subsurface uh, because of pressure and temperature, it's super critical, so a fluid, and, uh, but it's lighter than, than water, so it will rise to the top of the structures and it has very good uh, uh, thermal um, uh, properties. So when you reproduce and pure CO2, essentially, uh, you have the opportunity to, uh, to run turbines with that. With water at the same temperature, you could probably only do indirect uh, heat transfer. So with that, you can run turbines and, and generate electricity and, uh, and then re-inject it back into the reservoir. I hope that answers the questions, but there are a number of uh, of papers out there in the literature, CPG is the, the, the term that uh, to follow. Uh, this, this is Martin Saar who came up with CPG. If, if, I mean, I can answer questions if needed, specific questions about this. But yeah, if you, in the literature, we published this under CO2 pool geothermal or CPG. Yeah. Okay, it's Benjamin again. I would like to come back to uh, Volker because you mentioned this uh, CO2 accessibility and I, it was also addressed in, in a talk uh, dealing with upscaling uh, CO2 uh, uh, sequestration volumes. Do we have kind of an overview of uh, more numeric uh, how much uh, CO2 would be available uh, if we upscale it? Are we running soon into uh, thresholds that we cannot guarantee? Uh, enough CO2 accessible? Do you have any experience from uh, Saudi Arabia on this or is all fine in that way? Well, okay, so you saw the map that uh, that uh, um, Hussein Hotel has put together on my presentation. It'll be published soon or it's available. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, right now, all of the CO2 is vented, right? So, so, uh, so that, you know, I, I think we're a long way away from uh, from running out of CO2. But uh, you know, I, you know, it is it, eventually one could, uh, and uh, no, I think there's no shortage of CO2 that is being produced. I think in short, <laughs> not for the foreseeable future, yeah. at, at least not in our setting. Maybe out, elsewhere that that might be different. Other questions? I have more, but uh, I want to leave the room open for other people. <laughs> yeah, then I have one uh, going more towards the monitoring. I mean, monitoring is uh, quite important when we talk about uh, yeah, putting CO2 down in the, in the uh, subsurface. And in the talk from uh, um, Benward, you mentioned uh, this uh, fault activity. And so is there so you mentioned the 3D seismics to be used. Uh, what kind of resolution do we speak in there? And uh, also, is there any uh, indication of micro seismicity already ongoing to the salt caverns, or what's the state there? Obviously, I mean uh, the the required resolution uh, uh, depends on, for instance, the depth of the cap rock, and so on, and so on. Uh, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, micro, micro seismic monitoring is actually well, well established within the uh, salt cavern business. It's not a routine work, but uh, let's say whenever th something happened, like for instance in Bayou Corn, where you, where this uh, salt cavern collapsed, uh, seismic monitoring was done afterwards. Uh, I think that's definitely too late. This is why we uh, uh, want to, to do something in advance of anything to happen, yeah, mm, which is uh, seldomly done, unfortunately. Yeah, but with, with what I have shown, I think there's a reasonable potential for a risk of, of fault reactivation 
And uh, I mean, this is how I understand our HSD duties, which, which get hammered in our, in our heads. So we need to take action right now. And this is what my initiative is about, which is not my own. It's, it's together with the local people who are partly living on top of the caverns. But uh, I, I published an example about a 3D seismic which has been utilized for the planning of the salt cavern storage. Actually, the, the, the youngest uh, salt cavern uh, storage in Germany, uh, where I was deeply involved and where I actually did the, the modeling and the seismic interpretation and seismic attribute analysis. And it was amazing to see how in particular the 5D data regularization was improving the data in the parts, which obviously had an impact on the 3D depth migration in the deeper parts. Yeah, it was really amazing to see. And also we, we, drew, we have quite a, we have roughly 10 bl so-called blind wells. So wells which have not been used during the modeling or which have been drilled after after the modeling, which which prove the the spatial accuracy of the the spatial reliability of the anisotropic controlled beam migration, yeah. So and 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 they, to 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 finish that cube or that acquisition was done. Uh, it, it consisted of three vintages which have been merged by the seismic processor. Uh, one from mid of the 90s, one from the beginning of 2000. So nothing done lately, but it was really amazing to see how data quality could be improved, as I said, particularly in the shallow parts, because in that case, the top of the catwalk was in just 436 meters depth. Yeah. As, as a nice byproduct, we also detected a, uh, a paleofluvial system. Uh, in just uh, in basically two to three hundred meters depths, which could have been a migration pathway, but thank God it was six kilometers off and down dip. So a nice, a nice but positive uh, surprise. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. More questions? Everybody happy? Uh, Polo, you still want to say something or? No, I think we're done. Are we okay? Yeah, then I guess, yeah, we thank you a lot for this uh, stimulating uh, video conference. And as mentioned before, uh, yeah, we, are, we will be there in, at EIG in December 2020, hopefully. So it will be very nice if we could meet physically and discuss this in more detail. So yeah, then I wish you stay all safe and sound and uh, have a good rest of the week. Thank you a lot for all your efforts. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Looking forward to see you in Amsterdam. Thanks a lot, yeah. See you in Amsterdam. Thank you everyone for participating and thank you to all the presenters for taking their time out.